Pelvic inflammatory disease, also known as PID, is the topic for this video. And pelvic inflammatory disease is basically an infection of the uh, female genital tract. And um, it can affect a large uh, number of um, uh, parts of that genital tract. And um, those include the cervix, uh, the uterus, fallopian tubes, and also uh, it can also uh, in infect the ovaries. And um, this is a diagram that sort of shows it all. So here you have the cervix that's um, pointed by that little arrow. And then the uterus is of course uh, a little further up. And then on the sides you have these fallopian tubes. Um, on both sides you have one. And then of course these are the ovaries right here. And the infection can infect um, any part of this uh, female genital tract. Um, what is the cause? What is the organism? Well, there's two of uh, the most common. There's quite a few, but the two most common are Neisseria, Gonorrhea, and the other one is Chlamydia. Chlamydia trachomatis. And these two are by far the two most common. There's other organisms involved uh, that can be involved, but these are by far the two most common. And um, one thing that's in common with both of these is that uh, their mode of transmission is uh, sexual. So it's really an STD. It's, a, it, it's uh, sexually transmitted and um, most commonly occurs in women less than 35 years of age. So what are some of the symptoms? The symptoms of PID are actually pretty classic. Um, there's sort of a triad. There's lower abdominal pain. Uh, there's something called adnexal tenderness, and what that means is uh, pain um, in the sides uh, of the abdomen near the area where the fallopian tubes are. Uh, it can be unilateral or bilateral. And then something called cervical motion tenderness. This is most likely elicited on physical exam, and what that really means is that when the during physical exam, when you um, insert a finger and actually um, um, move the uh, cervix, that can cause pain. And other symptoms include fever, uh, discharge, uh, vaginal discharge, uh, yellow green discharge. Uh, a woman can also present with nausea and vomiting. Um, one important thing I'd like to mention before I move on to the diagnosis is that when a woman does have PID, this sometimes can lead to scarring inside this fallopian tube. So what they've done is they've sort of blown this up here, enlarged it, and showed that scarring. And that scar tissue can eventually build up in that fallopian tube, and that can lead to ectopic pregnancies because ectopic pregnancies happen because when this ovary here releases an egg it's not able to travel um, properly because of all the scar tissue it's not able to travel all the way down and implant itself into the uh, uterus the endometrium the scar tissue uh, blocks it and ends up uh, preventing it from migrating properly so that's very important to remember that PID predisposes to ectopic pregnancy. All right, so how do you diagnose PID? Well, obviously the symptomatology that I mentioned before, that classic triad, abdominal tenderness, adnexal tenderness, and uh, cervical motion tenderness. So that's definitely helpful. But then you also need to do either PCR or cultures um, to identify the organisms. And uh, if you remember, the organisms were Neisseria and Chlamydia, which are the two most common, Neisseria and Chlamydia. And um, another thing that's done uh, in the workup of PID is a pregnancy test, beta HCG, because um, ectopic pregnancy uh, that we just uh, talked a little bit about, its symptoms are very similar to that of PID. So when you're trying to diagnose PID, you also 
um, try to diagnose ectopic pregnancy and that can be done with a beta ACG. All right, so then now we get into the treatment. The treatment of uh, PID actually most commonly is uh, oral, outpatient, meaning you, you give the patient antibiotics. But sometimes the patient will need to be hospitalized um, and given IV antibiotics. So I'll talk a little bit about why. Well, the oral antibiotic regimen is very famous. Ceftriaxone, well, I said oral, but ceftriaxone is given as a shot, but outpatient, it's, it can be done in a clinic. And then doxycycline. This is very, very uh, famous, uh, very common. And uh, you, with or without, with or without metronidazole, sometimes metronidazole is given uh, to cover other bacteria uh, organisms like uh, trichomonas that can be causative in this uh, case. Inpatient uh, IV treatment is done if you feel that the patient will not have compliance or if the patient is very severe in their symptomatology and that can be decided by a physician um, uh, based on the presentation and there's several ways. Uh, there's uh, one way is uh, giving a cephalosporin like cefoxitin uh, plus doxycycline and then the another way is uh, sometimes people are allergic to penicillin so you give clindamycin and uh, gentamicin so there's there's a couple ways of treating it and then finally the last thing I'd like to mention before I get into some vignettes is that you have to treat the sexual partners as well uh, because um, this is a STD, so uh, most likely it was sexually transmitted. So you have to tell the patient to inform their sexual partner um, that uh, they need to be tested and treated as well. Okay, so now we uh, have a couple of vignettes here, and uh, here we go. So a 16-year-old runaway comes to the emergency department because of 24-hour history of lower abdominal pain and vomiting. She tells you that she hates doctors and hospitals and is only here because another girl on the street told her that this may be serious. She asks you to give her medicine quickly so she can leave. See, she is sexually active with multiple partners and she occasionally uses condoms for contraception. She lives on the streets and begs for money at the doorway of banks. She has not received any medical care in six years. Her last menstrual period was nine days ago. She is unsure if she ever had a sexually transmitted disease in the past. Her temperature is 101, blood pressure is 110 over 70, pulse is 65. Physical exam shows bilateral lower abdominal tenderness but rebound tenderness and guarding are absent. Physical exam shows cervical motion tenderness, adnexal tenderness and yellow white cervical discharge. There are no palpable masses. Urine pregnancy test is negative. Cervical cultures are taken and sent to pathology. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein are elevated. The most likely, most appropriate next step is. Well this has really described a lot of the symptomatology of PID. And um, I just want to quickly mention the C-reactive protein and the erythrocyte sedimentation rate are non-specific indicators of inflammation. So there obviously is some inflammation going on. So what do you do? Well, at first you might think we'll just give her some antibiotics and send her home. But the key thing in this vignette uh, is that there's a, a problem with compliance, um, poor compliance and poor hospital follow-up. She's homeless, and um, it's it's probably not uh, likely that she's ever going to follow up or even uh, uh, comply with the medication uh, that is given. So she really needs to be admitted and treated in the hospital uh, with uh, IV antibiotics. And the, f the last one, a 24-year-old woman complains with abdominal pain of rapid onset in the right lower quadrant. She subsequently undergoes surgery for suspected acute appendicitis. At surgery, however, a tubal pregnancy is discovered. The most frequent predisposing factor for this condition is. So what happened in this situation is a woman came in with um, uh, abdominal pain in the right side and she most likely went to an ER and the doctor there decided that she most likely has appendicitis. So she was sent to the OR and they did the surgery and they didn't find any uh, inflamed appendix. What they did find was a tubal pregnancy, also known as an ectopic pregnancy. So what they're asking is, what is the most 
common or most likely reason she developed an ectopic pregnancy. And if you remember earlier in the video, we discussed that PID predisposes uh, to ectopic pregnancy, and that's what this diagram was all about, uh, because PID can cause inflammation of the fallopian tubes and can cause scarring inside the fallopian tubes, and that can interfere with the implantation of the ovum, and that can result in a tubal pregnancy, which is what's being described in this vignette. So the answer choice would be PID.